Welcome to the Preservation Society of Asheville and Buncombe County's online educational series. We're glad you could join us today. We are grateful to all our sponsors, but this week we're especially grateful to Brunk Auctions, world-class consignments and exceptional results. This week, we're going to presume you've watched part one and not take the time to recap the history of the series, my biography, or the history of the Childs family in Kenilworth. If you haven't watched part one, stop now and go catch up. For the rest of you, we left off last week with a story of William Dudley Pelly and his silver shirts. Pelly had switched from mysticism to fascism, drawing the attention of federal and local government. He had raised and mismanaged a substantial amount of money, and the FBI had just raided his offices in 1942. A local judge allowed a group of Jewish community members overnight access to his records, so they stayed up late copying them, and to their relief, they found out that no, almost no one from Asheville or the surrounding area was a member. Local law enforcement and business community leaders assisted them in helping to take Pelly down. Pelly was found guilty on multiple counts of sedition and sentenced to 15 years in prison. After his release, he went about setting up a cult-like group devoted to expounding on the divine providence of UFOs and extraterrestrials. All the oral accounts I read indicated few people in the Jewish community encountered him, and they certainly weren't intimidated by him. They opened up the Jewish Community Center in 1939 across the street and down a few blocks from his offices in the Women's Community Center, which most of us know as the Plonk School, at Charlotte and Macon. And it was a relative of our next family, W. W. Michaelov, who is said to have gone undercover to help collect evidence that put Pelly away. Michaelov was the first cousin of Hattie Perlman, wife of Barney Perlman of Perlman's Furniture. The Michaelovs were also related by marriage to Lou Pollock's eldest daughter, Mildred, whose wedding gown we saw a few minutes ago. They deserve a few minutes at least to themselves, but I told the Preservation Society I'd try to keep these to a reasonable length. Barney Perlman was a Lithuanian Russian who came to the U.S. in the early 1900s. He became a citizen in 1918 and by 1927 had started a business dealing in small items of damaged and salvaged goods from the railroads in a little, quote, hole in the wall, as Sun called it, on Patton Avenue, the start of Perlman's railroad salvage. They expanded a bit into furniture, buying cast-off pieces from the Carolina Wood Products Company, which had employed an architect by the name of Ronald Green, who we know well by now. But it was the Broyhill Furniture Company that approached them and really got the Perlmans in the furniture business. Broyhill provided furniture on consignment during the Depression. Barney Perlman was expanding his business, and in true buy-your-bootstraps pride, declared that if a man couldn't afford to pay for something, he shouldn't have it. Fortunately, his wife Hattie kept a separate set of books tracking the credit offered to local families to help them pay for those goods which in turn contributed to Perlman's success. Barney once got into a dispute over a bill from the water company. He refused to pay it and instead used ginger ale in the toilets and water fountains. We had the fizziest toilets in town, according to his son Fred. They ran out of ginger ale and Barney reluctantly paid the bill. How ironic it must have been when Fred, his son, became head of the Metropolitan Water District in 1971. Fred joined the family business in 1933. By 1936, the Perlmans were renting Child's House. Articles from the period note Hattie's involvement with the ladies of the Jewish Aid Society with her neighbor, two doors down, Sarah Bremen. Barney was a member of the Asheville chapter of B'nai B'rith, which had been founded in Asheville in 1912. Their daughter Ruth announced her marriage while living there. This family shows a gathering outside in the kitchen courtyard at Child's House. It appears to be mostly Hattie's family with lots of Michael loves in the photo. In one of those strange connections across time, when we were doing some restoration work on the doors in the dining room and the baseboards, we found these commemorative coins celebrating the Westinghouse Golden Jubilee. We traced the year to 1936, and even further to this ad by Perlman's Railroad Salvage. Someday we'd like to find out why those coins were dropped behind the baseboards. The Perlman's success grew, and they moved to their own home in 1938. They expanded their businesses across Asheville and into several states after World War II and were a household name for many decades. The Pollocks and the Perlmans and many other families were part of a rapidly expanding collection of Jewish businesses in Asheville, 
especially downtown. According to an exhibit entitled The Family Store, A History of Jewish Businesses Downtown, from 1880 until 1990, there was a Jewish business in nearly every downtown building. They go on further to claim that for most of the 20th century, Asheville had the second largest Jewish population in North Carolina. Our video on Ronald Green recounts several of these business owners. Another one of those stores, Frocks and Frills in the Plaza Theater building, was owned by Nat Blomberg. I'm told by Barbara Blomberg that the Southerners say Bloomberg, while she introduced herself in New York as Blomberg. Volunteering at the Asheville Community Theater, I learned it as Blomberg, so I'll stick with that from habit. Nat Blomberg was living in the Ronald Greenhouse at 26 Childs, across the park from the Pollocks at number 24, and probably just missed being neighbors with the Perlmans across the street at 21. We remember Nat from our first video. It was his family that experienced the home invasion robbery in 1934, when armed men threw his dog through a window. The dog was not seriously injured. Nat also had a haberdashery business, and was known as a bit of a dandy and ladies' man. He left for Miami at some point, but like many other people who leave their birthplace, he eventually came back and worked for his brother Harry. But let's back up a second. In 1883, two brothers came to the U.S. from Lithuania, in fact, the same region as the Perlmans, and they may have known each other, according to Barbara Blomberg. Lewis came first, followed quickly by his older brother Aaron. Lewis came to Asheville in 1887 for health reasons, like so many of our subjects in these videos. Like many others we've discussed, he also dabbled in the motion picture industry, building the Strand Theater. He was a charter member of the Temple and was also known for his interest in bicycles, even organizing a bicycle club. The Blomberg brothers were both successful businessmen, and many companies are attributed to them. Aaron Blomberg had many children who all seemed to have started businesses themselves, and again, we could do a whole presentation on them alone. But since we're talking about Nat, we will focus on Lewis and his children, especially his sons, Nat and Harry. Like many second-generation Americans, Nat and Harry at times rebelled. Harry was said to have wheels in his head because of his great fondness for automobiles. Anyone who's been to the Biltmore Industries building to the car museum behind the Grove Park Inn knows just how much. If you haven't seen it, it's a must-see. He established a gas station, possibly the first in Asheville, at the corner of Walnut and Market. I know the building well as it is the costume and props annex for the Asheville Community Theater today. He established three motor inns because he rightfully believed people would want a safe place to park their car while they traveled. One of them was on the current side of the Thomas Wolfe House Visitor Center. When it looked like Thomas Wolfe's family was going to sell the iconic boarding house from Look Homeward Angel, it was Harry who bought it and sold it back to them to ensure that it would remain a monument to Thomas Wolfe's work. The family had a long connection. Thomas Wolfe's family in Woodfin, shown here, shared a backyard with Harry's parents. It is said that Thomas would often come over looking for a place to sleep when his mother had lots of boarders. Harry's mother used to grab him and bathe him when she got the chance, the feeling being that Julia Wolfe wasn't as good a mother as she could be. This is a good time in our own history to recall that Thomas's brother Ben died in the last worldwide pandemic, the Spanish flu, in 1918. In 1912, Harry and Nat's mother died, and their eldest sister Freda dropped out of school at age 17 to take care of them. She never seems to have regretted her actions. When she was honored in 1966 as Woman of the Week, she said she always looked forward, not back. I don't know what to think of some of my old friends, she said. They've given up, gotten fat, and in a rut. Me, I have color in my hair and makeup on my face and don't feel as old as I am. Maybe they think I'm queer. But I believe after we've done what we must, it's time to do what we want and have a little fun doing it. It wasn't just businesses that were being established. Local chapters of national Jewish organizations were being formed like Hadassah, which was formed or perfected, as they called it, on Childs Avenue at number 8 in 1921. Mr. and Mrs. David Greenberg hosted the gathering with the help of Mrs. S.I. Blomberg, one of Aaron Blomberg's daughters-in-law. A Zionist organization, it is dedicated to the maintenance of hospitals and social work, as well as advancing the cause of Zionism, a topic that wasn't popular with one of the local rabbis. That takes us to 17 Childs, a house we haven't seen before in these videos. It's another Spanish colonial revival home and was built on a plot of land owned by the Childs family, and perhaps 
even built as a spec house like they did with so many others in Kenilworth. Its first family appears to be Joseph and Sarah Bremen. Joseph retired to Asheville in 1923 from his company Bremen Steel and Metal, and by 1925 they were listed in phone directories here. He would live in the house until his death around 1954. His wife was active in many organizations, including the Ladies of the Jewish Aid Society. This group was formed in 1902 at the request of the men, it said, to help fund the new temple. Many society listings note activities like bridge and mahjong, sometimes assisted by neighbors like Hattie Perlman, as you recall. They were both involved in many local organizations, and after their deaths, the Joseph and Sarah Bremen Foundation, professor of social relations position at UNC Asheville, was created in their honor. Sarah lived for many years after Joseph, and several articles noting the celebrations of her milestone birthdays appeared in the local newspapers. In 1938, Joseph Bremen was elected president of Beth HaTepala Temple. His son, William, commissioned these beautiful bronze doors for the temple on the occasion of his parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Joseph Bremen's obituary noted he was buried in Riverside Cemetery. Wait, wasn't there another cemetery? The one named after Lou Pollock? Yes, but it seems that cemetery was more associated with Temple Beth Israel, while the Riverside section had been purchased by members of Beth HaTepala. Confused? I know I was. Beth HaTepala was the first Jewish temple in Asheville. It was established back in 1891 by 27 members on Spruce Street in a former Baptist church. A special gift was given to remove the steeple. Its founding documents note it was to be conservative, but as that distinction didn't formally exist yet within Judaism at this point, it is assumed to mean that it would follow the more traditional practices known by those from back in Europe. But it quickly evolved to more reform practices. The congregation ebbed and flowed with economic conditions and nearly folded, but it recovered enough to eventually build a new building at Liberty and Broad in 1948. When they outgrew that temple, it was expanded in place to preserve the original structure, including those beautiful bronze doors, I believe. One of the more prominent members from the history of this temple was Rabbi Michael Robinson, who marched with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let's take a brief side trip. In many of the oral histories and documents, I found multiple uses of different terms that seem to describe the same thing. So I pulled up this website and present the data here for your quick viewing. I always believe in getting information from the horse's mouth rather than the other end of the horse. The gist is that many people use words like shul, synagogue, and temple interchangeably. No doubt this is as confusing as Catholics and others describing the difference between a cathedral, a basilica, and a church. Caught up? All right, let's talk about the other temple, synagogue. Shul? In 1896, some members of Beth HaTefala felt they were straying too far from their traditional roots, and a group of recent immigrants and older congregants split off to form their own Orthodox temple, Bikur Cholim. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but I'll bet I'm not. Apologies in advance. The congregation eventually raised enough money to build a synagogue of their own on a property across the street from Julia Wolf's boarding house, where the Sheraton is today. Just as they completed construction on it in 1916, it mysteriously burned down. It was eventually rebuilt in place and received some assistance from the greater Asheville community, shocked by the destruction. In 1950, it changed its name to Temple Beth Israel. It moved to its current location on Murdoch in 1969. There were talks over the years to merge the two congregations, but there was always the tension between traditional or orthodox practices versus reform practices. At one point, an impassioned plea was made to adhere to a newer form of Judaism that would be relevant to the new generations of American Jews. Many families simply belonged to both. Lou Pollock was said to have been president of both congregations, although it's not clear if they meant at the same time. Some families split, with the husband belonging to one and the wife to the other. Those challenges echo across many religions today, and many denominations are splitting over these same types of debates. Lador Vador. Betty Pollock Golden shared that expression with me through her book, From Generation to Generation. That's the story of Childs Avenue and of Asheville, of North Carolina and the country as a whole, a community of people sharing their stories, the stories that shape Asheville. Stories of people who created organizations and networks of shared interest. Stories of people who created businesses and shaped the buildings that the Preservation Society fought 
and still fights to preserve today. Because they represent the spirit of Asheville that brings the new tourists and the new settlers of modern times. People who will in turn contribute and weave themselves into the Asheville fabric. People who someday, we hope, a new generation will study and in turn tell others it happened on Childs Avenue. This week I used a lot of resources that I hadn't before, so I did my best to note them so that I could credit and acknowledge and thank them here. Examine them further if you want to know more about the history of Jewish life in Asheville over the last 100 years. And again, any mispronunciations or factual errors were made by me unintentionally, and please know that I did my best. As always, thank you for joining us. We're nearing the end of our series, and we're glad you stuck it out with us. We look forward to seeing you one more time.